Our uh, speaker tonight is, uh, is Andrew Chappell. Uh, I'm glad that he is with us. Uh, he was born and raised in Georgia. He was taught about Jesus at a few churches. Uh, but his primary influence was here at Lawrenceville first. Uh, he left here and went to UGA and then straight to Candler School of Theology. Uh, he worked in youth ministry at Dunwoody UMC for five years before being appointed as associate pastor at Northbrook UMC, uh, where he has been for the last two years. Uh, there is one more line in your bio, but I don't... Go see it. <laughs> Go dogs. That's what it says there. That's what it says there. Uh, I have... Uh, I have so enjoyed having people come and speak to us each night that this church has invested in. Every once in a while, some folks uh, in, in the circles that I run in with the pastors that I talk to, uh, they'll complain and moan and whine about the future of the church. But as long as this church keeps churning out preachers, everything's going to be all right. Andrew is one that you've invested in a lot, and I, I uh, have had the chance to sit with him on a couple of occasions and just hear stories about his time here and the way that you've loved him into the man that he is, uh, the way that this place has formed him, and uh, the way that he has some wonderful memories of being in this place right here, and I know he'll share some of those tonight with all of you. Why don't you welcome Reverend Andrew Chapel? Go dogs. They made me write my own bio, so I had to put go dogs at the end. I had to read it. Yeah, you're welcome. Oh, man. Uh, it is... Hold on, I'm going to take a second just to see who's here. It's good to be home. Again, you, have, you wanted me back, or somebody did. Maybe not everybody. Um, but it is so good to be home with you this evening. It feels good out here, uh, and the Spirit is here this evening. I want to thank Shoal Creek for being back. I love you guys. You guys are so awesome. Um, and I want to thank Adam. You're a cool guy, man. It's been super fun getting to know you. Yeah, thank, thank Adam. He's a, it's been super fun getting to know him. We were, we were in Jeff's office earlier today, and Adam said, how are you feeling? And I said, I'm nervous. And he says, what? You're going to be fine. You know these people. And I was like, I know. And they know me. <laughs> uh, but he said it was going to be fine, and I've looked forward to A couple things I want to clear up. I got word about what Carter was saying about justifying shorts. Uh, I believe he said Davis Chapel wore shorts one time when he preached. I've never seen that happen. I've never seen dad wear shorts when he preaches, but whatever, whatever, we're cool. It's fine. Just wanted to clear that up. Uh, guys, in this, in this arbor, in this tabernacle, um, we have experienced so many different things together through the years. I, I, I was thinking back, I've, we've experienced good news, we've experienced tragic news. I've, I've knelt down at these rails too many times to count. I preached, uh, I preached my first sermon here on a sunrise service at like six in the morning on an Easter Sunday. I was also thinking about the, the fun times we had. Where's Garrison? There was one time, Garrison, when the youth used to stay out overnight under the tabernacle on Friday nights. I remember you were right over here. You were the first of us to fall asleep. And everybody knows that's the worst place to be. Because I think we found some of those sour straws, those gummy straws. We were sucking on them, and then we started decorating Garrison's face, arms, legs, whatever. He eventually woke up, found out, did not enjoy it, took it all off. But when he turned to look at us, he still had the, the little dye from it all around his face and he didn't know it for a while. We eventually, I mean, somebody told me that happened. I'm not sure of any of that information, but there have been so many good times under this arbor and it feels wonderful to be surrounded by those memories of, of people who have touched us through the years, of those present, of those who have gone before us, you can feel it. People like Elaine and Sam Martin, Charles and Julie Farr, Lorraine Jones, Ken Moore, Margaret Tanner, Dustin Manning, Thomas Brown, so many others, you can feel it. 
And it's so humbling to present a word to you this evening. It's humbling because from 01 to 2013, you taught me. You preached to me. You pastored me. You taught me about Jesus. You taught me how to look for a verse in the Bible. You taught me how to play a guitar in a worship band, how to roof a house at lap. You taught me how to shoot a BB gun, how to slingshot a hamburger across an open field. You taught me the correct amount of energy drink to drink on a spring break retreat to stay up the whole last night. Many of you taught me how to bark like a bulldog. Buck Bearden, if he's here, he taught me how to drop an elbow on a cockroach. You taught me that late night Waffle House is really good, am I right? Any of you think late night Waffle House is good? You taught me that Golden Corral is the food of the gods. And you taught me not to take myself too seriously especially when we're in togas at a talent show. <laughs> but more than anything, you taught me how to love. You taught me how to engage people, those around me, my immediate community, as well as those I'm not very familiar with. You taught me how to do that. And so I wanted to say thank you. I'll always keep saying thank you as long as I can for your influence on my life. Now, I want to start by reading our scripture for today, and I want to invite Haley, where's Haley, my sister up. Haley just graduated after three years of working on her master's degree in clinical mental health counseling, which means she reads a lot. Yeah, we can clap for her. Which means she has read a lot. She's a professional reader. So I asked her to come and read our scripture for today. So will you stand as she reads our New Testament passage for this evening? Jesus said there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels to be with Abraham. The rich man also died and was buried and his soul went to the place of the dead. There, in torment, he saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have some pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. I am in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted and you are in anguish. And besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man said, Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, if they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, they won't listen even if someone rises from the dead. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. You may be seated. Thanks, sis. I know what you're thinking. That's a super happy passage to end camp meeting on. I promise it's going somewhere. Just bear with me. Um, our theme all week, at least from what I hear, has been engage. And we've been looking at Acts 2. 42, the church, the early church, the ideal church. I did a church planting group for a year one time, and when we were, whenever we were asked, what is your ideal church, a few of us always just responded, Acts 2, 42. That's the ideal church, a church that practices daily, that shares in communion and prayers, that grows, that holds everything in common. No class, no status, everyone just in love with God and loving each other. It's the ideal church likely feel, filled with some idealists. Henry Ford said that an idealist is a person who helps other people to be prosperous. And this church was filled with those kinds of idealists, the kinds that get things done. Now, we usually don't view idealism as getting things done, do we? We typically view it as kind of head in the clouds kind of people. There was an idealist son who was having a conversation with his, his realist father one day, and the, the son said to his father, I have so many ideas that would revolutionize life and innovate mankind for years and years to come. I have so many ideas. And the father said, great, how about you take out the garbage and do the dishes first? That's fine. That's typically how we view idealism, right? 
Not a lot of getting things done. Carl Sandburg said, I'm an idealist. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm on my way. But this vision of the early church is filled with idealists who are not simply thinking, they're doing. They're on their way and they know where they're going. They're engaged with each other in fellowship and worship, communion with the world, with each other. And it's a wildfire that is engaged with the spirit, with the community, and with the world. And a key to this engagement is that middle section of the Acts 2 passage. The message says it like this. All the believers lived in wonderful harmony, holding everything in common. They sold whatever they owned and pooled their resources so that each person's need was met. So what does that mean? Well, what happens when you hold things in common? What happens when everyone puts their resources together? What happens when there is no need, when all the needs are met? Everyone is on equal footing. At least... Economically, which is usually one of the biggest factors regarding status, right? Everyone in this ideal early Acts 2 church seems to be of the same status. And as the church would change and incorporate more and more people, Paul would later articulate, there is no slave or free, male or female, circumcised or uncircumcised, Jew or Greek, there is no status but one. Your status in Christ Jesus, that's it, nothing else. And so in Acts 2, when the church is of one status, it's booming. The engagement with one another, with the community, is unlike anything ever seen. There's no competition, no game of who is better than the other. The playing field is level. And when you start there, the future is filled with endless possibilities. It's actually one of Luke's major themes in his two-volume set. The passage we read from is Luke 16. And in Luke and Acts, he authored both of those books. He wrote this incredible volume to Theophilus, a Gentile official in the Roman government. He wrote his gospel and its sequel as a Gentile to Gentiles to get across one major point. And that is salvation through Jesus Christ is for all people. For the things that previously determined status, riches, power, have been turned upside down and they don't matter anymore. One of my favorite professors in seminary said it like this, Luke is centered on the invitation for all to participate in God's project of redemption for the world. It's about everyone, not a few, especially those who have been left out. Jesus is the ultimate destroyer of status. He levels the playing field because Jesus knows that when the playing field is level when status no longer matters and people can stop worrying about competition. They start focusing on engaging in the work of the kingdom. You see this from the very beginning of the Gospel of Luke. When John the Baptist begins baptizing in the wilderness, you remember what he quotes? A voice crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make his path straight. But Luke includes a little bit extra. Luke says, every valley will be filled and every mountain and hill will be leveled. What happens when you fill in a valley? What happens when you level a mountain? The ground becomes even. There's no longer a higher place or a lower place. It's all one. And Luke does this again and again and again in his gospel and in the book of Acts. In Luke chapter 9, what determines status? Who is the greatest? Anyone who welcomes a child. Because in the kingdom, the least is the greatest. Luke 13, those who are last will be first, and the first will be last. Jesus is the great undoer of status. He is the great leveler. And so throughout his ministry, Jesus is working on that. You see it again and again to dismantle status. So he starts traveling towards Jerusalem, continuing to teach this radical understanding of humanity And right after Jesus shares three parables, which we're all familiar with, one of a lost sheep, another of a lost coin, and the last of a lost son, Luke takes us into some hard teaching on riches and wealth. And he says this, you cannot serve both God and money. What is prized by human beings is detestable in God's sight. And that's when he heads right into our text for this evening, a parable about a rich man and a poor man. The rich man had everything. The fanciest clothes. He feasted every day. 
He lived in a nice, gated community. He had everything. But the poor man had nothing. The poor man actually lived day and night, survived right by the gate. The man's name was Lazarus, which ironically means God helps. <laughs> but Lazarus received no help. Day in and day out, the rich man walked around him. After all, he was disgusting. He reeked. He was sick, covered in sores. And Lazarus sat there begging, hungry, anything, any crumbs from the table. He says his best friends were the dogs. And so we learn that both men died. Lazarus was carried by angels to the bosom of Abraham, which is regarded in Judaism as the place of the highest happiness and holiness. But the rich man was buried, and he fell to Hades, where during torment he looked up. And who should he see but the poor man sitting right next to Abraham. And the rich man yells out, Father, Abraham, have mercy. Send Lazarus to just dip his finger in water to cool me off. I'm in torment. But Abraham says, child, remember during life, you got all the good stuff. He got nothing. And now you receive ag agony and he receives comfort. Besides, no one can cross from here to there or from there to here. The rich man yells again, then father, please at least send him to my father's house. I've got brothers there. They need to know what they're up against so they don't suffer the same fate. But Abraham says they have Moses, they have the Torah, the scriptures, the prophets, they need to listen. But the rich man continues with his plea. No, if, if someone were to, to just go to them, they might turn, repent. They might change. And Abraham says, if they cannot listen to Moses or the prophets or the scriptures or anything like it, they will surely not be convinced by a resurrection. Now what's happening? What is Jesus doing? What's the purpose of the story? Well, he's doing everything that Luke has been doing. He's undoing status. Traditionally, in most societies, the following phrase has always been true. Maybe you know it. It's not what you know, it's who you know. And typically, who you know has been the wealthy, the powerful, the intelligent, the well-off. And once again, just like in Luke, Jesus turns the cultural norms upside down. Jesus explicitly illustrates that if you are to know anyone, it's not the rich man. It's Lazarus. The old ways of status are gone. The hills have been leveled. The valleys have been filled. Treasures on earth do not matter. In fact, they may actually work against you. John Wesley said this, It is no more sinful to be rich than to poor, but it is dangerous beyond expression. That's what Jesus is saying. Wealth is dangerous. The earthly treasures are hindrance. Sell everything you own and give it to the poor, he said. Life is not determined by what you have, he said. Blessed are the poor, the hungry, the thirsty, the grieving. But how terrible for you who are rich, who don't hunger, who thirst. For Jesus, the current cultural status symbols no longer dictate who is great and who is not. Jesus measured greatness in terms of service, not status. And in the story of the rich man and the poor man, He's deconstructing status into service and saying that mountains and valleys no longer matter. We are all the same. It's kind of like if Jesus says, you, you want to follow me. <laughs> if you want to do that, you want to, you want to know what the work of the kingdom looks like? You want to please God? You want to engage? Then start by forgetting everything you know about status and serve. Give aid to the poor. Invite the desperate to the table. Use your resources. Treat the sick like family and forget status. That's the message. But it's interesting. That's not what sticks, it's not what sticks out to me about the story. That's not what humbles me. It brings me to my knees at the altar. I love the story. I love its message. It's hard. It's convicting. It's challenging. It's necessary. But there's something I connect with even more, especially under this arbor, and especially with so much of my family in faith here. Let me ask you this. In the parable we just read, what is the rich man's name? 
What's his name? We don't know. Luke doesn't share it. We don't know it. The rich man has no name, but we do know someone's name, don't we? We know the poor man's name. We know Lazarus. Why is that important? Well, what happens when you know the name of someone who suffers? What happens when the person you pass by every single day has a name? What happens when the person at the counter has a name, when your neighbor has a name, when your enemy has a name? You want to talk about leveling status. It begins at knowing the name. Because knowing someone's name begins a relationship. Knowing someone's name begins a relationship. I had friends who grew up on a farm that said, that's why you never name animals. <laughs> because a name changes things. It begins the relationship. That's why pet adoption agencies give you the name of the puppy you're holding. Because they know you might take it home if you know the name. The name changes things. Earlier this year, I had the privilege of going to Israel on a two-week trip. It was phenomenal. I highly <laughs> recommend it to everybody. It's incredible. It's so much in such a short amount of time, but it is amazing. And we took time to go to the Holocaust Museum in Israel. And that is one of the most meaningful and tragic experiences I have ever had in my life. And off to the side, it's a, it's a huge museum, but off to the side you have to walk around the museum outside to this little building. And in this little building they have the children's memorial for all the children who were killed in the Holocaust. And you walk down this short path, downward path, and you walk into this building and you quickly realize this is going to be probably the darkest part of the tour, literally. And you walk into a room and it's pitch dark. You can't see a thing. There are twinkling lights everywhere. It looks like you're walking through the night sky. You can't see your hand in front of your face, but you can see stars everywhere. And as you're walking through, every once in a while, a voice comes over these hidden speakers. You don't know where it comes from. You're just walking in the dark. And a voice comes over these hidden speakers. And it speaks. And then it goes away. And then 10 seconds later, it comes back on and it speaks. And then it goes away. And 10, six, 10 seconds later, it comes back on and it speaks. And then it goes away. And you know what the voice says? All it says one after another, is the name of one of the children who was killed. That's all it is. That is the memorial. It is a walk through darkness where you hear the names of every child killed in the Holocaust. Why? Because there is power in a name. When you know the name, the six million plus killed in that tragedy becomes tangible. When you know the name, you have a new responsibility. When you know the name, there is no status. There is just humanity. And in Luke, Jesus tells a story and beckons us, know the name. You want to engage the community. <laughs> know somebody's name. You want to engage each other. Know somebody's name. You want to look a little bit more like the ideal church. Know somebody's name. Like an Acts 2.42 church, know somebody's name. The name of the person next to you, the one you pass on the street, the one who asks you for food, the one who waits on your table, the one that serves you. Because friends, once you know their name, everything changes. When I was 11 uh, years old, my sister and I got home from school. We just got off the bus. And we walked inside and we did the usual when we get home. Uh, we got snacks. We turned on the TV, but then mom quickly turned it off, as usual. Uh, and she turned it off, and Dad was there too, and they sat us down on the couch, and they told us that my father had been assigned to a new church um, called Lawrenceville First United Methodist Church, which sounded like a different planet to me. As a fifth grader, I didn't know anything. I didn't know anything about this place. We had a church of our own. We had relationships. We had people that knew us, that knew our names. We already had a church family. We didn't need another one, I thought. We were scared. So my family cried together because we'd been at that previous church seven years. We didn't know what we were going to do. We were terrified, but we moved because you have to. I'm learning quickly. <laughs> and one of the first things we did at this new church was something called camp meeting. 
We had been to camp meetings before, but never to one where we knew nobody. And so we were present the whole week, morning and night. I don't remember a lot. I remember being awkward. (laughs) I remember being shy. I remember being scared the whole time. Until the last night. I remember Brent Bohannon was the youth minister. And the youth were about to go midnight bowling that night and then stay out at the campground all night. I wasn't even a sixth grader yet. I remember he came over and he said, I want you to meet some people. And he introduced me to Ashley Quick and to Keegan Bailey, both of whom were two years older than me. They were about to be eighth graders. I mean, talk about status. They were about to run the place. And I remember they took me, they introduced themselves to me. They, They said, hey, Andrew, it's good to meet you. Come with us. And they took me with them and they started introducing me to people. Hey, this is Andrew. Hey, meet Andrew. So and so, this is Andrew. And gradually, people began to call me by my name. <laughs> and a relationship formed that ultimately changed my life forever. The first time I felt at home in this place, at this church, with this family, wasn't our first Sunday. It wasn't when we moved into the new house. It wasn't when I started the new school. It was when you knew is when you knew my name. Nothing else mattered. Not grade level or coolness or how well we midnight bowled. Nothing else mattered because you knew my name. And because you knew that, because you knew my name, I was home. Because you knew my name, because you engaged me, I could become engaged in a community that sought to reach out to each other, to the city, to the world. But it started because you knew a name. When I was in youth ministry, some of the darkest conversations I had with students, we'd sit in my office and they'd say, I don't think anybody even knows my name. There's a loneliness that can happen. But I believe that Jesus has called us to great things. To change the world. To reach out to people. To feed people. To clothe people. To give people shelter. But you can't get anywhere without knowing their names. It starts there. Friends, we live in a world that identifies people as groups, as numbers, as objects, as items. But the moment we know the name, everything changes. You're in relationship, you become responsible, you become a fellow human being, and you can't just sit there. And so I want to tell you tonight that wherever you are, whatever is happening, you may be the one by the gate. You may be poor, hungry, thirsty, grieving, tired, exhausted, scared, passed by, lonely, feeling like no one knows your name. But friends, I want to tell you this evening that whatever it is, there is one who does know your name and he is always and endlessly calling you home by your name may you understand that Jesus has reversed status may you forget about everything that the world throws at you and causes you to jump into competition with another may you begin living the kingdom of God Living like the kingdom of God has leveled the playing field. And above all else, may you know, always, may you know the name of the one in front of you. Because there is one who certainly knows your name. And he calls you to follow, to join in community, to engage with one another in fellowship and mission. You want to continue to be an engaging church. then know someone's name. Start there. Begin there. And don't stop. Let us pray. God, this evening I'm thankful to a community that seeks to know people's names. Because God, in that, there's relationship. God, I'm thankful that you have leveled the playing field, that you have done away with typical status rules. 
And God, this morning, this evening, I'm thankful for your son who showed forgiveness on a cross to all people and who is always calling us by name. May we hold on to that example. May we know people's names and build those relationships. That is what you have called us to. And God, as we gather at this table, a place where Jesus sat with his closest friends, may we remember that at this table we are one. We're all in the same boat. We're sinners in desperate need of your grace. So God, call us this evening. Call us by name. In Jesus' name, amen.